I'm here to be the first presenter on our study on fiscal effects of the COVID-19 pandemic, assessing public debt sustainability in the Philippines. Now, our uh, research questions are very straightforward. Next slide, please. Our research questions are very straightforward. Given chance, is the national government's level of debt on a sustainable path? Second, is there fiscal space left for spending which is needed for economic recovery? The objectives are also straightforward coming from this. Examine the immediate impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and related fiscal policy responses on the Philippines' public finances. The study also provides a broader historical frame for assessing the recent run-up in debt. Now, in this particular study, we perform three empirical exercises that try to determine first how the public debt to GDP ratio will evolve in the next half decade. Second, the fiscal adjustments needed to bring debt to more comfortable levels under different timeframes. And third, how fiscal policy will likely respond to debt and other relevant macroeconomic conditions. Next, please. The what, now, what was the impact of the COVID-19 crisis on Philippine public finances? Next slide, please. You can see here, let's, let's discuss first the bullets. The fiscal deficit as a share of GDP more than doubled from 3.4% in 2019 to 7.6% in 2020 and almost 9% uh, in 2021. And the primary deficit and the consolidated public sector deficit both widened to about 5.5%. Now, just to refresh your memories on these different fiscal terms, if you take a look at the figure on the upper right-hand corner, it presents the trend lines for the primary balance, which is defined as government's revenues less government spending net of interest payments on debt. So this is perceived to be the productive part of spending. This is what actually buys you the goods and services for every, part, for every fiscal year. Now, the fiscal balance would be the primary balance and you add back the interest payments, while the consolidated public sector uh, balance includes national government fiscal balance as well as other government entities balance, such as those of social security institutions. In the Philippines, we have social security system, the GSIS government uh, security and insurance system, as well as the PhilHealth. We also have state-owned enterprises or what we know as government-owned and controlled corporations. We also have as part of the public sector government finance, uh, financial institutions, as well as local government units. So the trend lines you can see are from 1986 to 2020, the topmost trend line, which is in color blue, represents the primary balance, which has been relatively positive. As you can see, we also have marked there the different crises faced by the, the country, the 1991 recession, the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, and the COVID-19 pandemic. And if you can see in the graph, the, the drop really was, was the most drastic during the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, going on still to the impact on public finance in the Philippines, national government spending accelerated by 11.3% in 2020, due in part to fiscal packages by Anihan 1 and 2. These were packages that, you know, really were tried to address the pandemic. It offered social protection assistance and social safety nets, as well as, you know, it provided the necessary health care um, and health sector infrastructure, as well as assistance to certain groups like um, small, medium enterprise businesses, etc. So there was a need for government spending. We all know this during the pandemic. However, public spending growth was not unusually high and was smaller compared to public expenditure growth in most recent years. Government revenues, however, saw an exceptional decline, collapsing by 9%. And this was largely because of the contraction that was triggered by the, um, the, you know, the halt in the economy, economic activities. Um, Partly also because of the lockdowns, there, that's why the econo economy contracted. If the economy contracts, of course, there's a smaller base for revenues. Therefore, revenues also collapse. And you can see this better in the trend lines on the lower right corner figure here, which, which presents the government's revenues and expenditures level and percentage changes. So the column bars here uh, represent, uh, similar to what Michael showed earlier, government expenditures exceeded government revenue. So government expenditures would be represented by the orange uh, column bar, while government revenues is presented by the blue column bar. And you can see that expenditures in the last part towards the right most of the, of the graph um, exceeded considerably revenues. And uh, if you look at the yellow trend line, 
that would represent the percentage change in government revenues, which drastically dropped as well because of the COVID-19 pandemic, which is what triggered the fiscal deficit. Next slide, please. Now, the effects of large fiscal deficits, of course, if you have a fiscal deficit, there would be an increased need for borrowing. So there was a significant increase in government borrowing. National government debt as percent of GDP increased from 39.6% in 2019 to 60.5% in 2021. And here you can see this at the topmost uh, trend line in the graph on the right, the blue colored one. And you can also see these are pitted against the Asian financial crisis, the global financial crisis, as well as the COVID-19 pandemic. So after the 1991 recession, um, there was a surge in debt to GDP as well as after the financial crisis, it started creeping up. After the global financial crisis, it did not so much um, spike, for, um, partly because we were sheltered, but also because we, there were a lot of reforms that were done in the mid 2000s in terms of revenues. Uh, uh, this, the next spike was in the COVID, uh, was after the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. So the current debt to GDP ratio is only surpassed in 1993 and in 2002 and 2004, where it peaked at almost 71.6% in 2004. Next slide, please. Now let's decompose public debt. So this is a historical view. We're trying to determine the difference between the debt now from, from previous debt crisis in the Philippines. So the current debt differs from previous episodes, because unlike before there were high, there was high external debt. Um, there was also the interest rate shock in the 1980s, which which contributed to high debt. There was also the absorption of hidden deficits of government-owned and controlled corporations, or, or state-owned enterprises, as is also known. Uh, this was absorbed by the national government, which increased the burden on uh, finance on budgetary requirements. But at the same time, okay, the difference is that now we have a relatively more um, prospective uh, tax system in place. There are tax reform laws to address the decline in tax performance in prior years. So since 2007, as I mentioned earlier, 2005, 2007, there were reforms that were implemented and more recently was the chain and the create laws, which we are banking on to help us um, you know, raise more revenues once the economy starts to, to grow again, to recover sustainably. Now the current debt, is the result of a large exogenous shock, not because of any fundamentals or challenges, institutional challenges in the system. Um, and also because of the large decline in revenues owing to the contraction of the economy. Now, later I'll be showing when we look at the, the projections of debt to GDP ratio that there seems to be an accumulation of cash reserves, but this seems to be a precautionary move on the part of government. Now, next slide, please. This is also a historical decomposition of national government debt. So there are five primary sources here identified. Uh, we would have the primary deficit, which I described earlier, to be revenues less the, the productive part of government spending, which is net of uh, interest payments. There's also the real interest rate, real GDP uh, growth rate as well as the exchange rate depreciation. Now, the sharp increase in the debt to GDP ratio in 2020 was driven mainly by the drop in growth, which is the light blue bar, uh, the last column bar on the right, if you can see it for 2020, and the large primary deficit owing to the, large, the drastic drop in revenues because of the economic contraction, which is the medium blue bar. So that, 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 is, that are the primary reasons for debt right now. In earlier years, like 92, 93, it was other factors, like the assumption of contingent liabilities. Um, in other years, let's say in 1998, it was because of the exchange rate dep depreciation after the Asian financial crisis. So that's how different this, this debt is right now. Next slide, please. So now I'm going to be presenting to you the results of our analysis of Philippine debt sustainability. We're using the standard IML DSA method. Uh, next slide, please. You can download this. It's easily available. It was updated just last year. Now, the basis of our fiscal outlook data for projections. Projections were based on data for fiscal, for key fiscal and other macroeconomic variables derived from first, government's medium term fiscal program, as announced by the DDCC, the uh, Development Budget, Budget Coordination Committee, 
which is comprised of the Department of Budget and Management, the National Economic and Development Authority, as well as the Banco Central ng Pilipinas. And the consensus view of forecasters from various financial institutions and research and forecasting firms such as World Bank, IMF, CIC, and Focus Economics. These sources were chosen because of the assumption that economic authorities are responsible for planned fiscal policy adjustments in the medium term and consensus forecasts can contain, uh, contain adequate information while also incorporating a more representative private sector view. Next, please. So this shows you, I won't discuss this in detail, I'll just go through the logic of this. This is the debt sustainability analysis medium term trajectory. So as I mentioned earlier, this study adopted the standard DSA mod method and publicly available template of the International Monetary Fund to compute public debt and public debt dynamics in the Philippines. So the evolution of the stock of public debt is expressed as this first equation. So it simply shows that the debt in next period or in period T minus one, T plus one, depends on obligations from the debt uh, existing in the previous period, uh, period D, as well as the impact of the primary balance. So this is where the primary balance comes in. Um, the primary balance here is defined as T, taxes, G is grants, so that's not government spending, unless the S, which is uh, non-interest uh, government expenditures. So this is how we, we would define primary balance. And if primary balance increases, that's why there's a negative sign. It means that uh, the government is raising uh, more revenues than it is uh, spending on non-interest um, expenditures. That means that there is more funds, uh, finances for, for financing the, the, the next year's budget. Therefore, there's less need for borrowing. So there would be a negative effect on the debt stock, okay? Now, there are also other one-time factors. O oh, here, it's positive. So these would be, let's say, the assumption of both implicit and explicit contingent liabilities or recapitalization of, of banks or, um, let's say, privatization um, proceeds or other things. These are other one-time factors that would add to the debt stock. Now, if you do a bit of you know, algebra and rewrite this, you can redefine this to be used to project the public debt to GDP ratio. So that would be uh, your uh, public debt as a share of the size of the economy, which is really the correct way to perceive public debt. Not so much nominal. Nominal is fine, but you have to see it with respect to the size of your economy or the capacity of the economy to pay off the debt. Now, as you can see on the left-hand side of the second equation, D, the small dt plus one would be the debt ratio, uh, debt to GDP, in the, for, in the succeeding period less uh, debt to GDP in the previous period. So this is a dynamic equation. This is what is estimated by the template. It shows the change, okay, the change in debt, the anticipated change in debt. Now there are four factors that would impact this. First would be the contribution of the effective real interest rate. If interest rates increase, the cost of borrowing increases, therefore it might increase your, it might, it is predicted to increase your debt in the succeeding period. Um, the second would be the contribution of real GDP growth. If this one has a negative uh, relationship, as according to this, um, the, as predicted by this equation, if real GDP grows, so there's an increase in your GDP, that means that there is a larger base for you to collect revenues, which means that you would have increased revenues, which would impact your primary balance, which is also in this equation, it's the fourth element there. And that would lead to uh, less borrowing requirement. So the, the change in uh, the debt to GDP ratio is expected. The impact on the change to de of debt to GDP ratio is, is negative. So you won't need to borrow as much because your economy is growing. The base for your revenues is growing. Therefore, it would have a negative impact on your debt to GDP ratio. Now, the contribution of the real exchange rate, there are two. Um, generally, when there's a depreciation, it is expected that foreign debt, okay, the value of the foreign debt, that's the valuation effect existing uh, in the previous period would increase because of the depreciation. So that would increase your, your debt to GDP ratio. Second would be the stock flow adjustment. That would be the adjustments between you paying off certain uh, debt, uh, foreign debt during this, during this period, um, but also increased borrowing um, during the same period. So there should be a net effect and it also should be adjustment for, for the exchange, uh, for foreign exchange now. Uh, adjustments. Next slide, please. Now, the result of this, we used all of the assumptions that I mentioned earlier, 
all government fiscal policy announced assumptions. So there are two estimations that we did here. On the, on the left, you see the evolution of debt to GDP ratio, um, just including what we observed there to be uh, excess cash reserves um, noted uh, as budgetary change in cash. Okay, so we saw this in the government accounts. So we accounted it for either as others or as increased debt, or we just excluded it because it could also be used to pay off debt. Now on the on the fat chart on the left, you see that the net the NG debt to GDP ratio will peak in 2023 at 66.8%. And it will stay there if you look at the matrix at the bottom until 2024 and uh, gradually declining afterwards. Okay, these are given our assumptions, which we took all from government, um, from policymakers' pronouncements. Um, the second bullet on the left would see it is assumed that the country will make efforts toward fiscal consolidation, maintaining the 1.7% of GDP primary deficit from 2024 to 2027. So that those are the assumptions here. These are government assumptions. Now, if you remove the you know change in cash and don't consider it as debt and consider it, you know something that you could use to pay off debt, uh, the debt to GDP ratio would peak still at 2023, but at a lower rate by 2.6 percentage points at 64.2 percent. Okay, next slide, please. Now we also did macro fiscal test, stress tests, and I won't show them all in, in the interest of time here, but I wanted to highlight that the one that showed the most risk in terms of the currently established sustainable debt would be any real GDP shock. This poses the largest risk, and you look at you can look at our paper or we can discuss this in more detail later on. Now, there are other risks outside of the macro fiscal stress test that were identified, and this is consistent with both the FSCC and the DBCC. First would be the military and uniform personal pensions. Uh, this is currently being footed by the national government, so this represents you know, a reduction in fiscal space for other spending. Second would be the possible, the, well, currently the PhilHealth is, has net losses, and if this is to be absorbed by the national government, this would also squeeze the resources available for other necessary spending on, let's say, human capital, such as uh, social protection, education, as well as the, the, the ticket item that would give you the larger fiscal multiplier infrastructure or uh, physical capital. Okay, the third, uh, the fourth would be the implementation of the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling. For those of you who are not uh, familiar with this, this represents a, sh a certain shift in governance in, in the Philippines. Uh, local governments here in the decentralized um, in the decentralized Philippines are entitled to a share of revenues collected by government. Now, what the Mandanas Garcia Supreme Court ruling did is it broadened the base on which to compute the transfers that LGUs are entitled to representing a reduction also of the fiscal space at the national level, which is which causes, you know, there to be increased opportunity for local governments to be partners in national development by really spending on um, local development. Now, um, natural calamities also and disasters would also um, pose risks, you know, that the Philippines is wrought by typhoons uh, about 20, 25, I think, is every year now. Uh, aggregate demand risks, such as the ge geopolitical risks mentioned earlier by by um, both of the both the UN representative Gonzalez as well as President uh, Orbeta, um, and uh, so this also would possibly disrupt or you know have an impact on that sustainability risks as well as cyber security risks. So next slide, please. I hand you now over to JP. JP, thank you. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. Next slide, please. Okay, so in this part of the study, we ask the question of how large are the fiscal adjustments that are required for the government to reduce the debt to GDP ratio to the pre-pandemic level of 40%. So just to refresh our memory, um, the government actually managed to, to bring down the debt to GDP ratio to 40%. That was the average debt to GDP ratio uh, from 2016 to 2019, and it's the lowest level of, that's the lowest debt to GDP ratio in any four year period since uh, 1986. And then, uh, of course, uh, the pandemic happened, and that uh, debt ratio shot up to about 
and in 2021 that uh, rose further to 60.5 percent. So in this part of the study we want to know uh, the scale of the fiscal adjustments that are required in order to go back to uh, the pre-pandemic uh, debt ratio of 40 percent. So we answer that uh, question using the fiscal gap framework uh, developed by uh, Alan Auerbach of uh, University of California. So to introduce that idea, imagine that uh, we have a government with a high uh, current uh, debt to GDP ratio and it wants to uh, reduce that to some desirable level uh, at some point in the future. Now, if we assume that uh, GDP growth, the real interest rate and the exchange rate are fixed and constant, um, then the only uh, major variable that uh, the government has a handle on uh, in order for it to manage its debt is the primary balance, which we defined earlier as the difference between uh, revenues and uh, its spending uh, less uh, uh, interest payments on debt. So the government must um, improve its primary balance uh, either by uh, cutting primary spending or uh, raising more revenues or uh, doing a combination of both. So let's imagine that the government uh, projects uh, its primary balance to follow an improving path as, as shown by the graph on the right. So we see here that the primary balance improves from uh, from a from being on deficit and it gradually that deficit gradually shrinks shrinks and uh, eventually turns into into a surplus. Now uh, the question is uh, whether that uh, improvement is enough to for the government to actually uh, reach its uh, its uh, debt target. Now uh, next next please. I, sorry sorry. Uh, can you go back? Sorry. So uh, let's assume that uh, that is not enough and the government actually has to, to follow a more stringent path of fiscal adjustment in order to meet its, its uh, debt target. Uh, then the difference between those two curves that you see on, 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 the, on the right is, in, is the fiscal gap. So uh, next. So in words, uh, the fiscal gap is the amount by which the primary balance expressed as a percent of GDP uh, must be increased uh, annually over its projected path in order to reach a target debt to GDP ratio over a, over a certain time frame. So uh, below we have a simplified formula for, or for uh, calculating the fiscal gap. So that says that uh, the fiscal gap is equal to the difference between your initial debt to GDP ratio and the present value of your target uh, debt to GDP ratio and minus the flow of uh, present value, the flow of the present value uh, primary balance as expressed as a percent of GDP. So what this means is that in order for a government to reach its uh, target debt to GDP ratio, it must generate a flow of primary balances that is equal to the difference between the two terms. Now, if it fails to do that, if the flow of primary balances is smaller than the difference of the first two terms, then it cannot meet its uh, target uh, target debt ratio unless it uh, raises those primary balances by the amount of the fiscal gap annually. So in uh, this framework, uh, in the framework that we use, uh, GDP growth and real interest rates are assumed to be constant and it abstracts from foreign debt. So uh, movements in the exchange rates do not uh, affect the, the debt ratio. And there's also no feedback between uh, the macroeconomic variables. Next slide. Okay, so to calculate the fiscal gap, we need to make uh, some assumptions. So we need to set our initial year. We need to set our initial debt to GDP ratio and our target debt to GDP ratio. We need to set uh, the time frame for debt reduction. And we also need to make assumptions about the path of uh, the GDP growth rate, the interest rate, 
So here we set the initial year to 2021 and the initial debt to GDP ratio to 60.5%, which was the debt ratio uh, in 2021. We set the target debt ratio to 40%, which was the pre-pandemic level that uh, we assume the government to aim to achieve. Um, we calculate the fiscal gap for three alternative terminal years, 2031, 2041, and 2051. And these correspond to time horizons of 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years. And we assume that the primary balance uh, improves from uh, six, negative 6.96% 6 of GDP in 2021 to negative 0.81% of GDP by 2031. So uh, negative 0.81% of GDP is actually the average primary balance from 2016 to 2019, so right before the pandemic. So we are assuming that the government is going to undertake fiscal consolidation between now and 2031 in order for it to return to its fiscal position by 2031. Uh, and finally, for GDP growth and the real interest rate, we adopt uh, scenarios. So in the pessimistic scenario, the GDP growth rate is 5% and the real interest rate is uh, 4%. Uh, in the median or middle scenario, uh, GDP growth is 6% and real interest rate is 3%. And in the optimistic scenario, GDP growth is 7% and real interest rate is 2%. So of these three scenarios, uh, obviously the optimistic scenario is the most favorable for debt reduction because it has the largest gap between uh, GDP growth and real interest rate. Pessimistic scenario is the least fav favorable for debt reduction and the median is somewhere in the middle. Next slide. Okay, so these are the range of estimates uh, of the fiscal gap. Uh, expressed as the percentage of GDP by terminal year and by uh, macroeconomic scenario. So as we would expect, the fiscal gap is lower when the conditions for debt reduction are more favorable. So if uh, the uh, GDP growth rate is higher, uh, if uh, the real interest rate is lower, and if you have a longer time horizon for achieving the debt target, then the fiscal gap is lower. So for instance, for a 2031 deadline for achieving the debt target, uh, the fiscal gap ranges from 1.4% of GDP to 3.44% of GDP. That range falls to, to negative 0.1% of GDP to 1.8% of GDP under a uh, 2041 debt, uh, 2041 uh, deadline, and it falls further to negative uh, 0.58% uh, of GDP to 1.34% of GDP under a 2051 deadline. Uh, here we also notice that uh, the fiscal gaps associated with a 2031 deadline are quite high, ranging from 1.4% of GDP to to 3.44% of GDP. So what this means is that, for instance, under the median scenario, uh, where the fiscal gap is 2.42% of GDP, uh, that means that the, that that means that there must be primary spending cuts or uh, revenue increases or a combination of both that amount to an additional 2.42% of GDP annually from 2022 to. 2031, over and above the improvements in the primary balance that we have assumed for the period. And uh, because of the large adjustments uh, associated with a short time frame for achieving uh, the debt reduction target, we think that uh, quickly returning to the pre-pandemic debt ratio of 40% would be quite challenging, uh, especially because we think that uh, fiscal policy might need to continue to be conducive to supporting uh, the country's economic recovery, especially given the, the difficult uh, global economic environment. Okay, uh, thank you. That's it for me. I'm now going to hand you over to uh, Dr. Gonzalez. Uh, thank you, JP. Uh, next slide. Um, so as a last exercise, we tried to assess public debt sustainability by estimating what we call fiscal reaction functions. 
Next slide. Uh, what are fiscal reaction functions? They are functions that help specify the fiscal policy response to public debt, controlling for other influences on uh, primary balances. They indicate how a government will likely react to its debt burden based on the policy track record of the country or on what similar countries were able to achieve or sustain in the past. They also uncover systematic features of the policy process and possible nonlinearities in government behavior. Now, I tried to avoid the math as much as possible, but this is inescapable. I have to show you the function in its simplest form. You have on the left hand side um, primary balance at time t, and we want to see the relationship with the lag, uh, the year ago level, since we're using annual data, year ago level of the primary balance. We also wanted to see the relationship with lag debt, and we tried to control for other variables that influence the primary balance. Now we are interested in rho, which is the coefficient on lag debt. Why are we interested? Because it is at the center of our analysis for short run sustainability. It should be that rho is greater than the term on the right, where you have R minus G on the numerator and where R is the real interest rate and G is growth. And for long run debt sustainability, rho is also there. Uh, so rho over one minus beta is should be greater than the term on the right. So a lot of mumbo jumbo. We're really interested in rho. Why? Because if you look at the numerator and you look at it's R minus G on the, on the numerator, it's easy to see that if R minus G is negative, it is uh, the only thing you need to find out is whether rho is positive. So for as long as rho is positive, then for sure it is greater than the term on the right. And so you have both short run and long run debt sustainability. So it is R minus G, it's very intuitive. It's where you have either low uh, interest rates or high growth or both. And it's really the natural way to, to, uh, to uh, solve your debt problem, which is to grow yourself out of the uh, out of the, uh, the debt uh, uh, that the high debt that you may have. Okay, so this is what our economic managers always say when we want to grow out of our debt. Okay, so why is this important in the Philippine case? Next slide is important because uh, historically we do we have had um, negative R minus G. Uh, can you show the graph? So R minus G is the yellow line. So if you see it, except for the recession period, such as the 1991 recession and uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's usually below the zero line. So it's usually negative, which means we only need to uh, determine rho. Okay, so the results of a regression, uh, next slide, please. I'll just uh, read you the final results. Okay, uh, the key findings are one, since we have positive and statistically significant coefficients on lagged um, primary balances, we take that to be an indication of a high degree of inertia or persistence of fiscal policy. So if we have, we're in a period of surpluses that is uh, likely to go on for a period of time, if we're in a period of, of deficits, then that also will likely go on for some period of time. The next result, which is what we're really interested in, um, can you, uh, next please. Uh, so this is Rho. We found out that Rho is indeed positive and statistically significant, which means that fiscal policy in the country, in the Philippines, is generally consistent with the desire to achieve fiscal solvency. Um, so that's an important result. As would be expected, a surprise public spending leads to a fiscal deterioration because we have a, neg um, a negative, sorry, that should be negative and statistically significant uh, coefficient on the on non-interest public spending gap from the Hardrick uh, Prescott filter. Um, next slide, please. Another interesting result was that countries' fiscal authorities appear to capitalize on real exchange rate appreciation and the forces supporting it to build up primary balances and reduce debt. That is our interpretation based on positive and statistically significant coefficients on the real effective exchange rate, meaning when RER appreciates, when the exchange rate appreciates, uh, there's a tendency for surpluses to rise. Um, also, as expected, this is sort of textbook, we found uh, what we call twin deficits, where fiscal and current account deficits tended to occur simultaneously, as shown by a positive and statistically significant coefficient of the current account. Um, 
in one specification, so this is also another result that we'd like to zero in on, fiscal effort seems to increase when debt rises above comfortable levels. So what is a comfortable level for our particular specification? So this is slightly different from what I showed you. We have what we called a debt spline at the mean. And if you look at the graph, it's uh, 0 0.191, it's positive and it's significant. And what this means is that when debt rises above the historical mean, that is when our fiscal uh, managers are sort of spurred to um, build up the surpluses as a way to solve the debt problem. Okay, so uh, fiscal effort in that specification seems to increase when debt rises above the historical mean. Another interesting result, for, for me at least, is that among the crisis episodes, the COVID-19 pandemic indeed had been the harshest. It had the harshest impact on the country's fiscal balances. Uh, if you look at the graph, if you look at the COVID-19 crisis, uh, the bar protrudes to the left, so the impact is negative on fiscal balances, and it's the longest line compared uh, to the Asian financial crisis and compared to the global financial crisis. Next slide, please. So um, what are the implications for fiscal sustainability in the Philippines? So historically, uh, at least based on recent history, the Philippines debt tended to climb, the country's debt tended to climb with every recession, but government eventually managed to generate primary surpluses and to fiscally consolidate, albeit with a lack. Um, our empirical method confirms this observation and reveals behavior that is compatible with the desire to maintain fiscal solvency and to minimize the likelihood of a debt crisis. Um, developing ASEAN 5's capacity to improve fiscal balances declines as public debt escalates, which suggests natural limits to generating primary surpluses. So we also had runs for ASEAN 5, I just did not show it, but this is the result that beyond the, the mean, uh, uh, for their debt, uh, uh, the historical mean for the debt, uh, it, uh, the, the parameter is actually negative, which means it's harder for governments to raise surpluses when debt goes beyond that level. And that's, that's sort of intuitive because uh, that happens when your interest payments balloon, it becomes harder for you to imp make further improvements in spending, it make further improvements uh, uh, in collection, et cetera, okay? What we find, which is interesting, is that it's the reverse for the Philippines. Uh, so you could interpret it many ways. We'd like to interpret it, it as indicative of the fact that we do try to intensify efforts to protect our fiscal conditions as debt mounts, uh, obviously within a, uh, if it remains within a reasonable range, okay? Uh, so provided, uh, so this is important. So provided there is no structural break in relation to fiscal policies and institutions, one can expect the same set of responses to debt developments in a post-COVID-19 setting. So historically, this was how our fiscal authorities behave. And for as long as they behave in the same way, then we are, uh, we could be less concerned, okay? But uh, there has to be no major fiscal policy change. And if, there ever, if ever there is one, it has to be really carefully considered. Um, a sound fiscal track record helps allay concerns about sovereign risk and thus raise debt limits. So it helps us. A good track record actually helps us widen fiscal space. Good credibility, right? Uh, strong credibility uh, widens fiscal space which would be useful when one needs to continue to, to support a fragile economic recovery. So that is why we uh, think that similar dynamics justify the importance of a sound fiscal consolidation strategy to prevent an escalation of financing costs from derailing growth. Okay, so we started out with a very basic question, is the debt of the government of the country, given its fiscal policy and given the fiscal policy and plans of government, is it still on a sustainable path? So what have we learned? What have we learned now, from historical decomposition? We've, we sort of say, well, this time does seem to be different. 
this time that is really due to the pandemic and the, the lockdown and the economic standstill. It's not due to a declining, steadily declining tax effort. It's not due to profligate spending by government. It's not due to, um, let's say, a global hike in interest rate. Well, at least not yet. So uh, when you wrote this, it wasn't. From standard uh, DSA, that sustainability analysis, we found out that the large increase, the run-up in debt in 2020, almost half of that was actually accumulated liquid assets. So it was a buildup of cash buffers that the government uh, uh, stored uh, in, in the event of a long-haul COVID. And so there seems to be wide scope for future debt declines. Um, from fiscal gap analysis, uh, again, I just reiterate that it's not feasible to immediately aim for low debt, but it's, it's important to have a sound medium to long-term fiscal consolidation plan. From our FRFs, fiscal reaction functions, we found that there is indeed res response to fiscal policy that guarantees fiscal solvency in the region. However, there should be no structural break in terms of policies and institutions. So in terms of recommendations, it's very, very clear our recommendations are clear cut. Number one, no structural break, no fiscal policy reversals, especially hard won reforms like in agriculture, in power, in oil, no weakening of fiscal institutions, collecting agencies must collect, right? Spending must spend uh, efficiently, wisely, should be well targeted. We share the, uh, the conclusions of Michal, there should be spending. Uh, so fiscal consolidation is not fiscal stringency in our mm -hmm. book. We need to spend to avert scarring, as uh, our president said, but it should be well targeted and efficiently allocated along the same lines as Michal, healthcare, education, social protection, especially delivery, and infrastructure. We need to add that back, which uh, given our infrastructure gap, because it has both short-term and long-term multiplier effects. Of course, now, in, in given a narrowing fiscal space, maybe we need to res revisit something like the PPPs that, we, uh, that were introduced uh, several years before. And then finally, there, I cannot understate the importance of a sound, medium to long-term fiscal strategy. We need to rebuild our fiscal space um, and we need to sort of uh, give comfort to our creditors that we do know what we're doing and uh, we do know how to fix our you know our affairs and i think that will be needed in order to maintain macroeconomic stability thank you